Uh, hello, uh, I'm Dr. James Smith, the Lawton Corbett Research Fellow at King's, and welcome to the first lecture of the 2023-2024 King's Wargaming Public Lecture Series. Uh, King's Public Wargaming Lectures so showcase academic research, experts from the field of wargaming, new thought, practice, and more by research and practitioners along a particular theme. Over the coming years, we are exploring wargaming different aspects of power, that being sea power, land, air, cyber, and what I think will progress is to topics such as artificial intelligence, culture, finance, diplomacy, and space power. And there's certainly many aspects to explore both in the classroom and beyond, whether that be for nation states, the military, or educators. With that in mind, we're starting this lecture series by looking at naval wargaming. And this is very much a home run for Kings and Britain for multiple reasons. Naval wargaming came to Kings at the same time that military history did. In the late 1800s by former Royal Navy Captain and Professor of History, Sir John Lawton. His efforts very much focused teaching history so that it can be analyzed and useful to a range of audiences. Subsequent naval historians and maritime strategists like Julian Corbett and naval wargamers like Fred Jane could engage on matters such as doctrine for the military, policy for government and tactical training for the Royal Navy. Wargaming was a tool in their arsenal and remains so to educate and something I'd certainly argue that wargaming becomes so important to the naval and maritime field, perhaps more so than land because it's difficult to take a class to look at a naval battle. How can you study a maritime campaign of Britain such as how a maritime campaign for Britain enabled the conditions for the defeat of Napoleon when unlike battlefields on land, there are so few artifacts left by naval, whether them historical or contemporary. So what naval wargaming does, it makes the sea navies and sea power more tangible to the student. And to that end, naval wargaming, I think, has its own character and its identity separate, I'd argue, from the other forms of wargaming. And it's certainly the root of British wargaming due to Britain being an island. So compared to that, say, a Prussian or European wargaming, which can be found through Krugspiel. With world events in geopolitics and geostrategic trends like the Indo-Pacific and the fact that sea power's capability and Navy's abilities to influence events from the seabed through to space and over land has grown, it can be a little surprise that naval wargaming and interest in it has increased with much innovation, but also well-established roots. And I think it's fair to say the depth and breadth of naval wargaming has reflected that, whether that be ships' operations, amphibious warfare, or the new complexities of naval warfare that see new technological terrors arrive, such as hypersonic missiles, while space warfare has had to draw, draw from example from naval wargaming of the age of sail or submarine and anti-submarine warfare. The complexities of naval warfare and sea power present a host of both common uh, forms of warfare, but also unique ones such as range, command and control, and changing environments, that being below the ocean surface through to sea-based air power. We often forget, although this is planet Earth, it's far more ocean, and needless to say, there's a lot more to explore when considering wargaming, sea power, and naval warfare. So the format of today's lecture, I'm going to shortly hand over to our speaker, followed by a conversation between them and I, and then we're going to uh, have time for questions and answers. If you have a question, if you could place it in the Q&A function, I'll do my best to pick them up after that. Today's speaker needs little introduction, in my view, for the world of naval wargaming. Dr. Nick Bradby is a Ministry of Defence civil servant, a naval architect, and a member of the Royal Corps of Naval Constructors. He has a background in ship and submarine design, structural engineering, and particularly naval combat survivability. He is currently an honorary associate professor of naval architecture at UCL. At UCL, he teaches postgraduate ship structures and submarine design, supports the capstone ship design exercise, and is the director of the submarine design acquisition course. He's been developing technical focused naval war games for over 10 years, mostly as an adjunct to his teaching activities. So on that note, I'm going to hand over to Nick for his paper titled Naval Wargaming Beyond the Classroom. All right, thank you very much. Let me just work out which uh, screen I need to share. Is that shared? Can, has my slide shared? Yep, you're good. Okay, you're good. thank you very much. All right, thank you very much for that introduction, James. 
Um, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you, or good, good morning or afternoon, depending on where you are in the world. We seem to have quite an international audience. Thank you uh, for coming along. I hope this will be interesting. I've, I've titled this talk Naval Wargaming Beyond the Classroom because the classroom is where our wargaming efforts started at UCL. We primarily used them for teaching. And in the last 12 months, we've started to expand beyond that. So uh, I'm going to be talking about the, the recent work that we've done in UCL's Marine Research Group in, in Naval Wargaming and um, how that fits into the direction of travel from where I'm standing. Now, I'm, I'm going to be talking primarily here about technical focused games, uh, which is, uh, I think, a term which I've just made up. Um, and I'm not sure it's necessarily the best term. Perhaps a better word for this or better phrase for, for what I'm talking about might be engineering focused games. Um, but I was calling them technically focused games, and that means I can use a meme to illustrate it. So uh, that's an argument in its favor, at least. What I mean by that is, who the player is uh, embodying when they're playing the game. I think it was uh, James Dunnigan who said that a mark of a good game is that a player of the game can put themselves in the shoes of a specific person in that scenario. So uh, that's usually a commander. Uh, but, uh, but his point was that a good game has a specific person in, in the game that the, the player feels they can identify as. Um, and that's usually the commander of a force. For a technically focused game or engineering focused game, then the player embodies a design engineer or, or a designer of systems. Now, they may do that as well as embodying um, a commander, possibly at different stages during the game. Uh, and that's what we do um, with, with our technical games at UCL. And the game needs to reflect that. So the game needs to be able to uh, meaningfully take account of the choices the player makes um, as the designer as well as the commander. And most, most naval war games are not very well set up to do that, which is why we've had to develop a raft of our own uh, in-house games to do that. Now, this is not by any stretch a novel idea. Um, war games and even role-playing games um, that focus on naval or especially science fiction, as far as I can see, uh, containing a, a ship design element where you get to design the things that you're going to fight with have been around for decades. Uh, Trillion Credit Squadron here, a traveler supplement from 1981, is nearly as old as I am. Uh, and that's, that centers on, on the player as designer uh, and then getting to go and try out their designs and see how well they did. Interestingly, I think also one of the very first games to be subjected to a computer optimization routine, uh, allowing a computer to, to crunch designs and, um, and pr produce a, a winning set. So this isn't new. There are lots of games uh, around which contain design rules, uh, allowing the player to be both designer and then uh, operator. Um, but the, the level of complexity and the verisimilitude of those design rules varies quite wildly. Sometimes uh, they are purely to reflect the needs of the game. Uh, sometimes they have more of a, a slant towards reality. As, as engineering teachers, we want rules that reflect the, the reality of the situation as best we can. And um, we need to work out what it is, what, what decisions matter that the designer is, is, is making during that design process. And we need to reflect the impact of those decisions in the game. That's been the approach we've taken to teaching. And teaching is where the majority of our effort has been spent over the last 10 years. Uh, I am here as a teacher. Uh, theoretically, I'm not a war gamer or not employed to be a war gamer. I'm employed to, uh, to teach people to design ships. So my wargaming activities have come from those which help me to teach people the design ships. I've spoken a fair bit before about how we use war games at UCL as a teaching aid uh, and how we've developed games to help us do that. Uh, the photo on the left here is, is quite recent. That was from a couple of weeks ago. That's students on our MSC cohort on Tactics Day, where they, they have a morning 
uh, where they're introduced to the concept of naval wargaming and how it can help them um, in their capstone ship design exercises, which they'll, they'll get to in some months. But over the last year, we have started to broaden our focus from using these games just to teach students into broader engineering applications. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. I shall, should probably start by telling you a bit about who I am and where I'm coming from. Um, lots of people in the wargaming field uh, studied history or international relations. Um, and, and I'm not really, I'm not really a, a student of warfare. I am a student of engineering. I am an engineer by background, specifically I'm a naval architect. So I am, I am about designing ships and submarines. I've worked for the uh, Ministry, well, I, I've not worked continuously for the Ministry of Defence since 1997, but I did join in 1997 and I've worked the, the great majority of my career since then for the MOD. I'm a member of the Royal Corps of Naval Constructors. On the rare occasions when I have to wear a uniform, I'm a, a con Commander C, um, which is a, a sort of vanishingly obscure thing these days. I've been posted to UCL by the MOD uh, since 2016, uh, following on from my, my PhD in postdocing here um, to teach. Uh, and now I'm an associate professor here. Over that time, uh, well, back to about 2008 when I first came here, I've, I've taught a, a wide range of things um, ship design and, and submarine design, structures uh, of ships and submarines, uh, stability and hydrostatics for a while, uh, survivability, and also wargaming. Wargaming isn't a thing which we teach here for its own sake. It's something that we teach as a tool to help students design better ships broadly. Uh, and the amount of wargaming which we taught here has steadily ramped up over the last 10 years as I and my colleagues have developed more and more games and found more and more uses for them. I'm part of the Marine Research Group uh, within UCL. Uh, that is sits within the, the mechanical engineering department. And broadly, we, we do things relating to boats, boats and ships, um, and other things at sea. Uh, we both teach and do research. I work directly under Professor David Manley, who I, I believe might be listening. I hope you're feeling better. Um, shown here with me last summer in Washington, DC, uh, stood outside the former USS Boone, who some catastrophic marine research was shortly about to happen to. Um, we're responsible for delivering a couple of uh, key teaching um, courses. We, we run um, uh, an MSc in Naval Architecture. Um, there's a sister MSc in Marine Engineering run by the MRG. Um, and we also run the UK's uh, Submarine Design course, which is running right now and one week away from completion. So I have a slightly desperate bunch of students through that door um, who uh, hopefully won't barge in with questions during the talk. The MRG is bigger than just us. We have about a dozen other staff, um, ranging from research assistants all the way up to two full professors. So wargaming isn't a central thing that the MRG does, but wargaming does support many of our central activities. And over the, over the last 10 years, we have developed some, uh, some specialized games which do the things we need them to do when we haven't found commercial products that, that do those things for us. We do use commercially available games, um, Littoral Commander, for example, uh, South China Sea and Indian Ocean region. Um, they're very useful for teaching students specific things, but there are some things which we couldn't find commercial games uh, that covered at all. So we developed some games of our own. Uh, the, the first of which is uh, a balance fleet. This is a game which has been developing for nearly a decade now and um, is, our, is really our primary game uh, for teaching ship design. Uh, I've been leading the development of this and it's gone through about 10 different iterations over the years. It's characterized by very detailed representation of, of the ship to capture a lot of the ship's design features. You can see here, we've got a card representing a, um, representing a ship. This, it, it's labeled Type 31 frigate. That's, um, 
it's really a, a very rough, unclassified and open source approximation of a Type 31 frigate. There are definitely things in that which are going to be wrong, um, but that's because we're running everything at an unclassified level. You can see from the ship card that to represent a single ship, we, we capture a lot of detail. And that's important. That's because we want to capture the impact of the design, the design choices made by the student. So we have the layout because um, layout of equipment and system runs, uh, layout of watertight subdivision and uh, damage control zones uh, are all very important factors when it comes to the effect of a weapon hitting the ship. When a weapon hits the ship, we need to work out where it's hit the ship and resulting damage from that location. We look quite, um, we're looking quite some detail at air defense because primarily this is a game about deep water missile combat between ships uh, with some aviation. Um, and so we focus quite hard on that and we abstract out some of the things which other games might focus on. We can play this game uh, double blind, which is more realistic, a better representation of the asymmetry of, of information in naval warfare. Um, but we have a faster playing version of it, um, the face-to-face the -face version, which you can see here being played at the UK Wargame Workshop, uh, where we use Columbia blocks uh, to, to obscure exactly what is where, and we have dummy counters in there as well to complicate the mix. It's not quite as good a representation as, as properly double-blind, but it's much, much faster to play, and it doesn't require the same umpire support to, to maintain the game. The point is uh, that really the a balanced fleet is, is a toolbox of, of options. So we can play a game using the parts of the game that we need and ignoring the parts of the game that we don't. And uh, we can swap in features of the game like is this double blind or face-to-face or -face quite easily without changing the rest of the game. We have um, another game which is um, it's currently under development by David Manley. Um, Fleet Command, which is intended as a, a simpler introductory game. So where ADF goes into quite some detail about uh, you know, the, the layout and the capabilities of this particular ship, Fleet Command is, is really a game designed to teach students about what different warships can do and how they work together. So the difference between an air defense destroyer, an anti-submarine frigate, and an aircraft carrier, and how you would use all three of them in a task force to give you a coherent effect. We have some uh, specialist games as well, which we've developed, which cover more specific areas uh, of, of naval warfare. Uh, one of those is Swarming Boats, a game I developed a few years ago um, and which really has not evolved. Uh, it, it was written in a week and it stayed largely the same uh, since then. This is a game of close quarters, um, close action uh, between uh, usually a tanker escorted by either an OPV or a light frigate. Uh, versus a swarm of speedboats uh, armed with machine guns and RPGs. This is quite a fast playing game. I've heard it described as very fun and very frustrating, which I, I, I will try to take, uh, I hope, think was meant in a positive way. Um, but this, this game is useful to us because it covers stuff which the other games abstract out. In ABF, we consider a turn as an hour. We don't consider a ship's ability to maneuver. It can just drive in whatever direction it likes. Um, Swarming Boats focuses right down on the uh, very, very small scale. A turn in here represents 10 seconds of real time. The, the miniatures are in full scale, so the same scale as the map, uh, and the ability of ships to maneuver around each other and bring small caliber uh, guns to bear uh, becomes very important. And um, finally, we have another uh, game which uh, was developed by Dave Manley, uh, Cobalt Rocks, um, developed over the last year to look at seabed warfare, which is a, an area of increasing interest. Um, and we had a number of design student teams who were tasked with designing ships or submarines to um, protect critical national infrastructure from, from interference and similar things. We didn't really have a war game that could support those kind of operations um and so he developed one so that's that's our tool set generalizing a bit out now I, over the 10 years I've, I've come to embrace this um this sort of core philosophy of, of designing games 
And this informs the process that I use to, to produce games. Firstly, it's very important to know what the game is for. So when you sit down to create a game, you need to think about what you're trying to do. What are your objectives in doing this? Um, and focus on those objectives. It's very easy to try and produce a game which does everything. And then I feel it will never do anything particularly well. Once you've, once you've identified what your game is for, you need to know what the game is and what it isn't. By which I mean, work out what's important and work out what's not important for this game to model. If you try and model everything, then the game will either be very complex uh, or it won't do a very good job. Uh, if, you, if you know what matters and what doesn't matter, you can focus on modeling what matters well and to the required level of detail, and you can abstract out uh, a lot of the, the things that don't matter so much. And these are all in the service of making the game as detailed as it needs to be, and then as simple as you can make it. Because there's this inherent tension between uh, uh, complexity, uh, or sorry, veracity versus simplicity. Um, you can make a game more complicated and model more things, um, but the, the more you do that, the harder it will be to play, the harder it will be to learn, um, and the more it will distract the player's focus away from what this game is supposed to be about. So ultimately, that's what I'm trying to achieve whenever I sit down to make a game, as detailed as it needs to be, and then as simple as possible. So that informs this kind of approach, which I usually take when I'm uh, developing these games, particularly this is the approach that ABF takes. Um, we have the war game, and the war game should use mechanics which are as simple and elegant as possible. As possible whilst still doing what it's supposed to do and being the game which it is supposed to be. So there are things in ABF, for example, which I do in quite a fiddly complex way. Uh, if we have a um, if we have a ship attacked by missiles and it launches surface air missiles to defend itself, I could resolve the question, does the ship get hit with a single dice roll? But we don't. Instead, we, we have the players cross off individual SAMs as they launch and roll for every potential intercept to see if it hits or misses. Um, and, you know, defending against a raid of, of eight incoming ship to ship missiles, uh, you might wind up rolling a dice 15 or 20 times. Now that's excessively fiddly from one perspective. But I'm trying to remember what this game is for and what I want it to be. I want this game to represent the design decisions a student make. And I want the game to reinforce that impact to them. So by getting them to roll for every intercept, by getting them to cross off every SAM launch, it concentrates the mind on, on the importance of this process and on the importance of every stage. Did you provide enough ammunition? How good is the PK of the combat system that you've paid for? So we can make the things simple that we don't think matter that much, and we can deliberately retain complexity in the things we think do. Now, in order to get uh, um, credibility in, in, in the simple models in the war game, we sit them on top of some more complex models. So we have a, a suite of operations analysis models, most of which are big spreadsheets, um, an example here is the, the outputs page from the missile engagement model. Um, this is a big discrete event simulator, which lets us input um, uh, the, the characteristics of the incoming um, anti-ship missile, the characteristics of our defensive surface-to-air missile, the characteristics of the, um, the ship's surveillance radar, how high it is, how far the radar horizon is, and so on, um, the reaction time of the system, uh, and then this will do a big discrete event simulation and tell us how many potential intercepts we get and what the probability of success of each of those intercepts is. So that's a very involved process and we can distill that down into a simple lookup table which appears in the war game. There's a bunch of these different OA models which support the, the development of the war game. Um, and one of the nice things about this is how modular this approach is because if I wanted to concentrate on a 
a different aspect of the game, which I hadn't done before, it's relatively easy to uh, take a simple OA model. Um, you know, if I used a simple OA model to model something that I didn't think was that important, um, if the purpose of the particular game I'm running means that that thing is now important, I can swap in a more complicated in-depth OA model and, uh, and improve the model, but the player doesn't see that additional complexity. And finally, all of these models sit on a database, um, uh, a database which tells the game um, what the capabilities of various systems that it might use are. Now, there's a lot of different places that you could get data um, for that database. Um, and as far as possible, for the unclassified games which I run at UCL, I've populated that database straight out of Harpoon 5, uh, because that has a very extensive set of data uh, on the kind of things that we need to the kind of level of complexity that we need. And it is a nice, auditable, clearly open source data set, which I think is probably about as accurate as I can find anywhere in, in open source. Um, but it makes it easy to demonstrate where we got our numbers from. Now, if, uh, if a client wanted to use this game for uh, more detailed analysis using a classified data set, um, the advantage of this structure there is that it's quite easy for them to uh, just change a bit of it. We could change out the database and still use the same OA models um, to provide the same you know, type, type of simple model in the war game. We could change out an individual OA model to, to reflect some uh, some specialist software or, or something. Um, but it allows us to take bits out of the game and replace them quite easily. We sacrifice a certain amount of elegance for doing that. Um, but for our purposes, this is, a, I think, a more useful approach. So up until this time last year, almost all of our uh, wargaming efforts here at UCL had been focused on the classroom. And over the last 12 months, we have really started to move beyond it. Um, there are several different areas for which um, our technically focused wargaming tools have uh, proved potentially useful. Firstly, is, is education still, but education outside of the context which we were using it for. Uh, in particular, uh, domain familiarity. So, Wargaming is quite a good way of teaching people about the shape of naval warfare, uh, because if you play a game, it's an active learning method. You, you are forced to think about things and consider the, uh, the implications of, of things. Um, and it's probably much more effective than just telling people things. Um, so we've, we've applied that um, to in a number of, of external um, applications. We've also used this game to teach specialists about the other specialisms of, um, of ship design. Uh, the photo here is from um, Darman Naval uh, back in, in December last year, um, who had us come over to, to run them a, a day of gaming, um, primarily for uh, quite young design engineers who were mostly specialists. So they were specialists working together on a project but one of them might be a hydraulics engineer, one of them might be a uh, power distribution engineer. And they were all good in their specialism, but they didn't have the appreciation of the wider uh, design picture. So forcing them to play, forcing them to play, getting them to play a, um, a technically focused war game like ABF uh, allowed them to see why the ship needs subdivision and zoning and why they have to incorporate all of these inconvenient design features which make their lives harder because of the improvement to that mix to the ship's capability overall. Uh, another thing which wargaming can be quite useful for is, is communicating a concept. Uh, so if, you're, if you are working up a, a future ship concept, you're probably part of a reasonably large team and everybody will have their own specialism. Getting the wider team to once you have a design to play a war game with that design allows everyone to understand what the concept that you're all working towards looks like and it allows them to see how you expect a particular mission might be executed so that um uh, that that function of, of sharing a um sharing an idea among people but communicating it clearly 
so that you all end up with the same idea uh, is something where wargaming can be quite useful. The area which I am really interested, though, is in requirement elucidation. This is a really important part in the early stage of any design project where you try to work out what your specification is. So with a warship, you need to decide what your warship needs to do. And you need to decide that very, very early so that you can contract people to build a ship that can do all of these things. And it's a very difficult thing to do. Uh, requirements for something as versatile as a warship are very, very complex. Um, the way that different requirements interact with each other is even more complex. And um, it's, it's very difficult, uh, to, difficult to work out what requirement set will give you the best value for money. Now, Wargaming can help with this process. And we've applied Wargaming several times over the last year for various clients um, to, uh, to, to do things in this fit sphere. Um, one of the most important things is to understand your requirement. So if you, you start usually with a, a requirement that's written in very vague terms, user requirements sort of language, um, and turning that into a more concrete numerical engineering kind of language is a tricky process. Um, wargaming a mission out can help you understand that. Um, it can also help you explore options. If you aren't sure where on a capability spectrum you want to sit, then um, looking at different options and wargaming through them through various scenarios that are of interest to you can help inform uh, you on the um, on the relative capability of, of those different option sets. Now, sometimes that's obvious. If you're measuring something simple like probability of defend, defending the ship against a particular missile threat, you don't really need a war game to do that. You can do that with, with operations analysis and some maths. But there are things where there's a more complex mission, um, where you are using different systems together uh, within the same mission, and there's lots of different options for those different systems, um, that wargaming can actually be a very useful tool. Wargaming is good at finding gaps and synergies in complicated systems of systems, because it makes you actually use the whole system of systems in the way which you would want to use it. Uh, and that's, until you do that, it's quite difficult to spot those kind of inter-system uh, blocks and synergies. And I think probably the most useful thing that Wargaming can do, while acknowledging that Wargaming is not operations analysis and it, it, it cannot answer the kind of questions which OA seeks to answer, it can be very useful for helping you understand what questions to get your OA to ask. Um, Wargaming gives you a top level view of a mission and a, a ship doing that mission, um, and it can help you understand which factors are important, which factors your ship's uh, capability is sensitive to. And then you can task follow on OA to go and look at those, um, those questions with more mathematical rigor. So the majority of the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about um, a case study, which we uh, did this year. Um, this was a game developed and run for the NATO specialist team on naval ship systems engineering. Um, the structure of NATO I find wildly confusing, um, and I don't think I'm the only one, but NSSE falls as a subgroup within the NATO ship design capability group. Um, the, the, the higher level group had tasked NSSE to develop a NATO standard on the ship design process to work out how best we can design ships. Um, to work out how to capture stakeholder expectations and to control requirement setting. One of the questions which NSSE decided it wanted to answer was, can wargaming be useful as part of this process? Uh, can wargaming help us figure out um, what critical factors drive or, or should drive the design of a warship? Now, that was the question they wanted answered. And to get insight into that, they set a, a case study up. 
uh, the case study was to, to explore the question of how useful might offboard systems be uh, for future capability, uh, for future um, fleet designs uh, to do uh, ASW barrier operations. So setting up anti-submarine barriers close inshore to protect a critical area from, from submarines. That wasn't really the point of this study. That was an example question which uh, we looked at as a, uh, a sample to say if, if this was a thing we were interested in, how might Wargaming solve it so that we could draw some wider conclusions. The game happened in the spring. Now, um, this was set up right around the start of the year. In March, we went to Utrecht to meet with NSSC, uh, with the, the, the NSSC team of about a dozen people, um, and ran a one day concept demo. So we spent a couple of hours um, explaining how ABF works, and then they played ABF uh, to show them what wargaming could be like, and then to tease out of the group what additional capabilities they wanted, what they wanted the game to do that this game couldn't do. Now they had some idea of, of our starting point. Um, that gave us quite a lot to do and not very long to do it. So April 2023 was the, the game design period. That had not very much more than a month uh, to do that. And it had one person. Um, my role here was, was designing the game, what uh, Stephen Downs Martin would call uh, the inner game, the war game rules and scenario and so forth, uh, while other people manage the outer game of stakeholder involvement and um, uh, you know managing who would be involved and managing people's expectations. In May, we got a fairly large group between 20 and 30 people at any given time uh, together for a whole week, uh, four days of uh, one day of setup and four days of, of war game. Um, in Bristol with um, members of the NSSC team plus external subject matter experts. Uh, we had we were quite lucky to have um, a number of, of um, naval officers and ex-naval officers with um, ASW experience, which was very useful for the game, and a number of other interested parties who were just curious to see how this kind of game could work and whether it might be useful to them. So we ran the game back in May, um, earlier this month, presented the findings of this at the International Maritime Conference in Sydney. And, and here we are. This was, so this was the, the totality of it. Really March, April and May were, were when the game happened. Um, and now we are starting to think about what comes next. The scenario which NSSC chose for the case study was a, a NEO a non-combatant evacuation operation. Um, the, the scenario was decided by the NSSC group and provided to me. And it was broadly that we had a, an ostensibly friendly port in a country which was uh, currently uh, destabilized by a neighbor. And so had civil war and there was a, there was a risk of um, uh, disease in there as well. So the Blue Force was um, going to arrive with uh, some high value units, which were either um, assault ships or ships taken up from trade, which had passenger capacity. They were going to set up a screening system, uh, gather together entitled nationals, check them for infectious diseases, load them on the ships and then depart. Uh, the, the gathering and screening process was estimated to take five days. And so from the perspective of the ASW commander, uh, the scenario had three phases. They had to arrive in the area and get the HVUs safely to the port. Then they had to protect the HVUs for five days while they did their thing and loaded people up. And then they had to get safely, get the HVUs safely away back into international waters. Now, there was a threat uh, during this uh, coming from the Red Nation, which was a rival of the, the friendly host nation, um, who was seeking to um, seek to destabilize them and uh, was going to attempt to disrupt the, the NEO. Uh, Red had access to missile boats, um, diesel electric submarines, 
uh, mines potentially, and some asymmetric assets. Uh, we, we looked at different ways that they might, uh, might employ them, and diesel submarines eventually became the, uh, the dominant threat from RED, uh, but there were some complicating factors from, from asymmetric uh, assets as well. And then the idea was that we would conduct several different repeats of the game uh, to allow Blue to experiment with different force compositions. So we would start with a blue force mix that was um, basically current day technology. So uh, two or three ASW frigates with towed arrays and each with a wildcat or a Merlin helicopter. But after that, uh, after those sort of baseline games had been played, uh, we would switch out the existing frigates for conceptual future frigates equipped with a mission bay and a, a mix of offboard vehicles and allow Blue to explore different force mixes and see how effective they were uh, against the same threat. We ran the game over the course of a week. Uh, on the Monday was day zero. That was um, getting in and getting set up. Um, then on day one, the first day we had people, we uh, spent the morning doing a briefing about the objectives of the project and how to play the game and then running game zero, which was a series of training vignettes. So we didn't set up a whole game, we set up a situation, you know, here is a, here is a submarine, here is a target, now it will make a torpedo attack, and that's how a torpedo attack works. Here is a submarine, here is an ASW frigate, now it will, we'll see how frigates detect submarines and how we send a helicopter to drop a torpedo on it. You know, nice self-contained situations to allow people to practice the things they just heard about how the game worked. That took the morning, um, and in the afternoon, we ran the first full iteration of the game. Each iteration, <coughs> excuse me, each iteration took about half a day to run. Uh, and so we figured we would be able to run two games a day. Um, the first game was uh, the baselines. So um, type 23s with helicopters and towed arrays uh, going through the insertion phase. At the end of the day, we realized that actually we'd, we had plenty of people and we didn't need as many people per game as we had thought we might. So we were able actually to run two games simultaneously for the rest of the week. So on day two, we ran games 2A and 2B at the same time in the morning, games 3A and 3B at the same time in the afternoon. Um, and that's those were running the, the barrier phase um, using uh, the baseline ships, then using Force Mix 1, a uh, particular combination of offboard vehicles, um, and comparing those. And then after day two, we had a, we had a wash up session after every game um, to take, take notes and observations and draw conclusions. Um, at the end of day two, we had a brainstorming session where we asked players what additional capabilities they might find useful. And uh, then with subject matter expert input, uh, we were able to inject those capabilities into the game on day three, which was a key thing we wanted to demonstrate we could do. Uh, day three, we ran two more games, morning and afternoon, um, with a different force mix, again, for the barrier phase, and then a different force mix for the extraction phase. And then that gave us day four to um, wash up data capture and uh, discuss um, the, the outcomes and then allow the various international visitors to, uh, to get on their planes home. So that's the shape of the week. Within, within each game, we had a, a structure like this, uh, the number of people that we needed. We weren't sure how many people we were going to get on the day. So there was a certain amount of flexibility built into this. This is a fairly standard double blind approach. There's nothing revolutionary here. We had a red cell and a blue cell who were controlling the two sides. Um, and then we had a white cell, uh, which was in each cell was in a different room. Um, the white cell had the big room with um, a big map with everything marked on it. Um, the red cell only had what they could see. The blue cell only had what they could see. Um, and then we had the red team and blue team runners who were members of the white cell who shuttled back and forth between the two rooms and the white cell. And they did all the adjudication for those, those teams. So. Uh, adjudication was entirely rules-based. Where we ran into the edge of the rules, we had a game controller who could make a decision. Um, but generally speaking, for things like resolving 
positions, movement, and detections. Um, the red team and blue team runners were the people who did that. That meant that the red team and blue team cells actually didn't have uh, very much to do a lot of the time. They were making a plan, and then the runners were executing that plan until somebody spotted something new. Um, that is kind of the nature of ASW. Uh, it's um, awfully slow warfare. It's uh, the kind of thing that the plan unfolds and unfolds until it doesn't. Uh, it's not until it doesn't that you start to need to make new decisions. We also had a green cell uh, embedded in white, which controlled neutral traffic um, and occasionally managed um, injects for particular things that we wanted to um, look at, like a communications jammer um, or um, uh, intelligence agency observers uh, in, in a fishing boat going around and trying to gather intelligence on, on the barrier setup. Now, we'd set this up so that it could need seven, eight, nine, 13, 14, 15, 16 people per game. And in the end, we concluded that eight people was plenty. Um, one, uh, one game controller, one green cell, uh, and then two uh, two uh, people in each of the red cell or blue cell, um, because having two people always leads you to making more considered decisions than if you have one, and then red and blue team runners. So that was the realization that allowed us to run two games simultaneously. In terms of uh, the spaces we set up, again, this was terribly conventional, nothing unusual here. We had a, a control room for the white cell, which had the main map. Then we had the blue room and the red room. Um, for each of those, they had their own maps. Um, because the blue cell was running an ASW barrier, which tended to have lots of units in it, and the red cell was just usually running one or two submarines, um, we allowed the blue cell to directly observe the truth map. Um, and whenever they wanted to come in, we would just hide the submarines and record their location and then put them back on. Nothing revolutionary there. That's, um, that's going to be normal to anyone who's run a double blind war game. So we were quite lucky in that we were starting with a game, ABF, which would do most of what we wanted to do. But when writing ABF, I remembered what the game was for and what was important to me and what wasn't. And so I had written the game to include some things in detail and other things not at all or just abstracted out. And what we were doing with this game was different. So what mattered and what didn't matter had changed. So there were some things which we needed to include in the game, which we didn't already have. Uh, first among those was sonar. Uh, now I have, I have tried to implement sonar several times over the years, and it's, um, it's just very painful because uh, radar detection, you can, you can make quite simple and it's still reasonably good. Sonar is just tremendously complicated. There's so many factors that affect the probability of detection in a given situation with sonar. The target speed, your own speed, the water depth, the environmental conditions. Um, so making a, a, a complex, make, making a simple enough model to play from that complex situation, I've always found very challenging. But we were obviously going to need a sonar model this time. Sonar detections work over such short ranges relative to radar detection that we needed to reduce the distance scale. Uh, so whereas ABF has traditionally, traditionally, uh, whereas ABF has previously used 10 nautical mile hexes, we needed to drop down to one nautical mile hexes. When you change your distance scale, you need to ensure the time scale matches. Um, and so we had to reduce the turn length from hour long turns to 12 minute turns. Now that was fine, except that this game also had to represent a mission that lasted a week. And there's a lot of 12 minute turns in a week. So clearly that wasn't going to be something that we could do by stepping through every turn. So we needed some kind of telescoping timescale system to make that workable. We also needed to represent weather because weather has a significant impact on, on sonar performance. Um, we needed to include uh, water depth because water depth well, firstly, affects sonar performance quite a lot. Um, active sonar doesn't work well in shallow water, uh, and shallow no water is noisy, which means passive sonar is less effective. And then very shallow water, ships can enter, but submarines can't. So that was important in a way it had never been. We also had a focus uh, on offboard vehicles. So we had to look at 
uncrewed vehicles of different types, um, how we control them, and the idea of roulement. So if you have three vehicles on board and at any time one of them needs to be charging uh, and two can be in the water, then you need to plan that cycle uh, in how you deploy them. Now this was, this was quite a lot of changes, but luckily because the game has a very modular structure, it was relatively easy for us to create systems for each of these things. We could just plug in relatively easily. Now, one big problem here was that we didn't know what was going to matter. We didn't know what was going to be important until we played. Um, for example, we included missile boats on the red side, and we therefore had to include a small localized map and a huge area map. In the end, it turned out the missile boats really didn't affect the game at all, and we disregarded one map completely. But we didn't know that until we played, because those kind of insights only come out of quite complex interactions between systems, and it's difficult to know until you do. And that's exactly the point of this kind of wargaming. Um, there are things which you just can't know until you run through how you would do this with a particular set of, of capabilities, um, and you look at the whole of the, of the scenario. Now, because we didn't know what would be important until we played, and we knew that we didn't know, um, that limited how much we could streamline the various models. So um, like with um, surface ship missile defense, there were things that we could have done in a very simple way. We could have had a, an OA model crunch the various probabilities of um, firing a torpedo against a particular grade of, of, of sonar uh, fix um, and then work out the probability of, of correct placement and then conduct however many re-attacks it could make in that situation. And we could have boiled that whole thing down to a single number and presented a lookup table. But if we did that, if we then introduced some new thing that interfered with how you know, changed how torpedoes worked, then it would be very difficult to build a simple streamlined model that we wouldn't risk violating some assumptions that we'd made uh, when we introduced new capabilities or new technology. So we kept the models quite raw. Um, we looked at what steps would happen during an attack. We modeled each step explicitly and each step basically had a resolution. Uh, attached to it. So making a torpedo attack was still quite an involved thing that involved stepping through a bunch of stages and you know rolling for placement and then rolling to make an attack and if you missed maybe make several re-attacks. That was okay because torpedo attacks didn't happen that often in any given game um, so it was worth the um, it was worth the complexity and what we got for that complexity was uh, the ability to introduce new tech without upsetting any of our existing models. Another feature was, as I mentioned, the need for two maps. So um, the sonar um, scale map had one nautical mile hexes, that's the big map shown here, um, but we needed, um, we needed to be able to also have fast missile boats potentially doing missile combat. So if we had submarines that could be detected at three nautical miles, but we also had missile boats that could find missiles with a range of 80 miles. Uh, we couldn't possibly do that on the same map. So we had this system of a map within a map. Um, you can see there are seven hexes, which are, well, you can see on, on the main map, we've got small hexes, and then there are uh, mega hexes overlaid on top of those. Each mega hex is 10 miles, so it covers 10 small one mile hexes. Um, and then seven of them are labeled A through G, on the area map, you can just about make out in the top left corner, there are seven hexes with a gold border. Those are also labeled A through G. And each map, each um, hex on the area map corresponds to a mega hex on the, the small scale map. So we could have things happening on both maps that could interact with each other. In the end, it turned out that wasn't very necessary. And after the, the first game, we basically ditched the area map and we did everything on, on the one. But we didn't know until we played it that that was going to happen. We also needed to model uh, water depth. So you can see on the main map, we've got uh, dark blue for deep water, uh, light blue for shallower water, and then white for shallower water again. 
Um, that was a very simple representation. I think it was a 60 and 40 meter um, cutoff. Um, basically being the areas which uh, sonar became degraded in and then submarines couldn't enter. We had a whole bunch of new features like sonar, but also off-board vehicles, uh, and introduced this, uh, this new approach, which we hadn't done before with ABF, of having capability cards. So every, every sensor, every aircraft, every off-board vehicle, every weapon had a single card a6 in size which contained all of the information that you needed to operate that sensor or that vehicle or whatever and so we could easily change the force mix by just dealing a new uh, collection of these cards around each ship um, that meant we didn't have to produce uh, new ship cards for every uh, every iteration um, and that allowed versatility uh, having all of the rules on the capability card for that card um, also made life easier because you generally, if you were seeing if a particular sonar could detect a target, you just needed to pick up the card for that sonar and do what it said on the card. So we also needed to control weather, control weather. We needed to account for weather and um, we needed to keep track of time with 12 minute turns over the course of a week. And the way we wound up doing this was with this huge A1 game time control sheet. So that broke the game down into seven days. Each day was broken up into an eight hour period, one night time and two daytime. Um, and then within that eight hour block, oops, within that eight hour block, um, we had eight individual one hour uh, sections. And then within each hour we had five 12 minute turns so in theory you could step through the whole week going from block to block you know 12 minutes at a time but in practice what happened was blue would plan their asw barrier red would decide when they wanted to attack it and we would basically skip through the time until an eight hour block where something interesting was going to happen red had the option of choosing the time in the week when they made their attack and that was often weather dependent the um we had these meteorology cards which were just dealt out one card per eight hour block at the start of the game um and they had effects on spotting distance or um on sonar performance also being nighttime had a, a further effect on spotting distance um but nighttime of course happened at the same time every day we, we forecast the whole, well, we, we produce the whole week's weather at the beginning of the game, but we would release uh, the next three days uh, weather forecast to players at a time. So Red could look ahead and maybe see that, well, in two days' time, there's a stormy afternoon coming. So we'll hold off until then and we'll sneak our boats through uh, in stormy weather when it's much harder to hear them. That meant that actually we could resolve a week, but we didn't need to model the whole week. Uh, the game runners could just execute blue and red's plans until red was actually trying to sneak a submarine through the barrier and and then we could resolve that in the much smaller time scales in order to assist this we also needed to produce a bunch of um, planning aids to make it easier for both sides um, one very simple thing which was very helpful was turning up with a huge stack of a3 printed versions of the maps so as well as the huge um each each game main game map was two a0 sheets so they, they were pretty big um but by reducing them down to a3 printing a load of black and white copies that site players could just grab a few of those and they could sketch attack plans they could sketch their um sketch their asw barrier um here we can see a furiously complicated arrangement of um sonar dyne seabed um seabed static sensors um, that they'd uh, blue had built a castle around their uh, their port with um the other thing was uh, rule want planning sheets for the the uh, uxvs allowing them to work out when each uxv was in the water and out of the water for charging and, and so on um so that we could just go through the the week until red was making their attack look up what blue stuff was in the water at that time and then have blue uh, have the blue runner set the uh, the barrier up accordingly so
So that was how the game played. Largely, it was a case of Blue Root writing their plans, Red writing their plans, and then the runners just executing the plan, which was a lot of skipping ahead eight hours in one go um, until something might uh, present new information to one side. We had these big old maps um, and big tables uh, for the runners to sit around. Um, tiny little um, ship uh, and submarine uh, chips, um, helicopter um, miniatures. Um, and the game was quite visually appealing in that regard, which I think is important. Um, having having uh, stuff which you can look at and immediately know what it is uh, helps to reduce the, the cognitive barrier to players. And for a game like this, I think it's very, very helpful to reduce, remove those cognitive barriers as much as you can because most of the players are playing this for the first time. So the quicker you can get them through the what is this and how does it work and into the right what do I want these units to do style of thinking the better um you you can perhaps see in the bottom right here uh a colossal tactical error uh, that got made um this is the the task force arriving the HVUs in a box in the center surrounded by three frigates with um their helicopters out with um dipping sonars uh, scouting ahead um and there are three submarines lying in wait in shallow water for them because this team decided not to sanitize the the area before moving the hvus in uh, they thought well if we just escort them in then that will be fine um and they discovered that uh diesel submarines sitting on the bottom are very quiet and very hard to detect and um their hvu group just got ambushed uh, and that went very poorly um People learned quite quickly uh, about what was a good and a bad idea to do. Um, and the photograph above that, you can see a much more successful ASW operation um, as a, a USV off to the right is trailing a towed array sonar, um, which has picked up a, a red submarine just as it's trying to sneak out of the area. Um, and a Merlin has been dispatched to, um, in fact, a Merlin and a Fire Scout have been dispatched to try and drop torpedoes on it and sink it. So the game was quite, uh, the game was, was large periods of, of, of moving very rapidly ahead through time and then uh, slowing right down to look at very detailed, um, very detailed uh, engagements in quite, uh, you know, quite small time steps uh, with, with the boats moving a mile at a time per turn or so. And I think that's just by nature, the shape of, of ASW. That's, that's how the game had to be. I mentioned that between days two and three, we, uh, we did a technology insertion. Um, that was very helpful. Uh, and there were a bunch of things which we added. They fall really into three categories. There were things like uh, ASROC, which are existing systems that we know the capabilities of pretty well. Um, one of the things which the players concluded was having operated with Force Mix 1, where they their ASW capability was um, was mostly rotary wing UAVs carrying lightweight torpedoes, which um, on, on a contact, they would scramble, it would fly over, it would drop a torpedo. The problem with this was, firstly, um, rotary wing USVs don't have a very high payload capacity and torpedoes are quite heavy. So the USVs were carrying typically a single torpedo um, and a single torpedo might hit the submarine, but actually its chances of doing so weren't that high. So one torpedo wasn't really enough for an engagement. And by the time it had dropped it, it would have to turn around, fly back to the ship, land, rearm, possibly refuel, take off and fly out again. And you might well have lost the contact. Um, crewed helicopters were better because they could carry more torpedoes. Um, but even with crewed helicopters and UXVs, and you know multiple UXVs, the ships wound up flight deck spot limited. You can carry a lot of rotary wing USVs, but you can only have one turning on the pad at a time. So um, actually one large helicopter isn't easily substituted with several USVs for doing that job because you can't scramble them all simultaneously. The team concluded what they really wanted was a, a quick responding ASW weapon that they could used to drop a, a torpedo on a submarine at range without having to scramble an aircraft. 
uh, those weapons exist. You know, we know we know Azrox's uh, capabilities fairly well, um, and so that was very easy to just put into the game. Uh, and later iterations, they could use Azrox on there from their from their Mark Forty One VLS. The second category was things which exist, but we don't have a good handle on their capabilities because we haven't used them in this context. Um, one of the SMEs suggested that um, they'd quite like to employ seabed static sensors. Um, they were able to point to a commercial product which did the sort of thing that they were interested in. Um, and then between that product's uh, brochure online, some SME judgment, um, and some physics, we were able to characterize what we thought that, um, that uh, equipment would do. Uh, and so put that in the game as well. And the third category was stuff that doesn't exist. One of the things which the, the teams found was that their frigates had torpedo decoys, surface ship torpedo defense system, but their high value units didn't because their high value units were commercial in some cases. And the HVUs also had very noisy machinery, which meant the submarines turned out to be able to hear them from a long way away and make very long range torpedo shots against them. And there was very little that could be done at that point, short of parking a frigate next to it and hoping that its torpedo decoys worked. So the teams asked, would it be possible if we could have a USV that we could use in the escort role? A USV that we could just send to sit near the HVUs with an intercept sonar um, and some active decoys, um, so or hard kill decoys. So in the event that it detects a torpedo attack, it has a chance of actually intercepting the torpedo. Now, as far as I know, no such system exists in the world. Um, but we can imagine what it might look like. We can imagine an uncrewed surface vehicle with about the right size of payload, um, and we can look at a hard kill torpedo decoy system. Uh, so it wasn't very difficult to um, consult some SMEs, do a bit of naval architecture, um, and come up with a concept card which might well be plausible for a system like that, which allowed us to then try this hypothetical system, and you know, assuming that it worked like we imagined it would, have a think about how useful that would be in this kind of situation. Um, and this, this process uh, allowed us both to demonstrate that we could insert new technology into a war game very fast, but also that we could introduce hypotheticals into a war game um, and allow uh, players to answer what if questions quite easily. So that's what we did. What would I do differently the next time we did this? And by which I mean the next time we do this, because um, there, there is already some follow on work um, uh, that's, that's coming out of this. Um, Firstly, the main thing which I only really learned by playing was there was quite a disparity of workload on the teams. In particular, the blue team had a lot more to do than the red team did, because the blue team basically had to manage a whole ASW barrier with three or four, you know, two, three, four warships um, and maybe a dozen offboard vehicles all doing stuff, lots of moving parts. Whereas red were probably controlling two diesel powered submarines. So blue were doing a lot of thinking, red did not have to do so much thinking, and a lot of the time the red players didn't have very much to do. I think what I would want to do in future is give each pair of teams two games. So if you were playing the blue team in game A, you would also be playing the red team in game B. So since both teams would be playing a red and a blue force, uh, the workload on them would naturally balance out, and that would keep everybody roughly uh, evenly loaded and therefore roughly equally engaged. Um, boredom is the enemy because if you don't have very much to do, it's quite difficult to, um, to stay focused. Um, another thing which I will learn for next time is anticipate that you might have more people than you were expecting and that you were able to run two sets of games simultaneously. This photo here uh, is me looking very pleased with myself. Um, this game ran during the heat wave back in May. Uh, it was one of the hottest days of the year. And after day one, I'd gone home and I had to make a whole second set 
of game pieces. And I have a laser cutter in my garage, and that's safe to run if the cooling water is between 10 and 20, 22 degrees, I think. Um, and the cooling water was at 25 degrees when I got home. So I had to walk, uh, find a garage that could sell me um, bags of ice. This is my, my triumphant return home with a cool bag full of ice that I could ration into the cooling water for the laser to uh, keep it cool enough to go through and cut all these pieces in time. That would have saved me some effort if I'd realized in advance that that might be an issue. Um, next time I would prioritize the learning curve a bit more than I did. Um, remembering that most people who are doing this have, well, even if they have played a war game before, which they probably haven't, they almost certainly haven't played your war game before. So the the more hurdles you can remove from the process of them getting their heads around the game, uh, the quicker you can get them into the actually thinking about what they're doing and what they want to do and what things they might try phase. In particular, I think well-designed play aids are really useful here. Um, the capability cards were quite good, um, but there are some things I would do next time, like have ammunition be physical objects. So maybe little wood cubes for each missile or torpedo, um, and so when you load that onto a helicopter, you pick it up off the ship and you put it on the helicopter, um, rather than having check boxes, which it's easy to lose track of. Um, those kind of simple things can really make a difference in how easy it is for players to get their head around the game. And finally, I will try more to remember what the game is for, that fundamental design principle that I claim is at the heart of my design philosophy. Um, I let the in, in iteration one i let the um the players decide not to sanitize an area and then run through the game and discover that that was a terrible idea because they just lost their force immediately to an ambush we knew that in advance was a terrible idea and we shouldn't have wasted a game slot in illustrating that point to them um i wasn't trying to teach engineers naval tactics that's what we had the navy smes for um and I shouldn't use the game to try and teach them tactics. Uh, if that's a problem, I might use pre-games to teach them tactics. Um, but this is about focusing on what your game is trying to do and not spending valuable game cycles doing other things with your time. So that brings us towards our conclusions, of which I have two pages, because the first page is the immediate conclusions from the game. Um, but remember, of course, solving the ASW barrier or investigating the ASW barrier problem isn't really what we came here for. So there's another set of conclusions on the next slide. Um, but things we observed from, from playing this game uh, for, for three days. Um, surface vehicles, uncrewed surface vehicles towing tow array sonars turned out to be really effective. Um, it was quite a cheap way of allowing Blue Force to increase its mass of sensors. They had reasonably good detection range. As long as the targets were in deep water, then um, these sort of thin line crater rays uh, turned out to be pretty effective. Conversely, uncrewed underwater vehicles turned out to be much less effective. Now, in theory, they were great at detecting submarines. The problem was it's hard for them to communicate. They need to surface to communicate. And until they have onboard edge processing that can take raw sonar data and say, you know, instead of saying, well, I've got this noise and actually say, oh, that looks like a kilo. Um, they don't know to surface to transmit that. So they were quite good at telling you that a submarine passed through here three hours ago, but that's not very tactically actionable information. Um, everything needs comms. If you're using offboard vehicles, you are absolutely dependent on a robust and reliable comms network. Uh, and as soon as that gets attacked, it's a problem. Uh, I've seen advocates of um, particularly UAVs say, well, it's not a problem if the comms get hacked. It will, you know, it'll, it's got a safe return to base mode. If it can't find the, the launching ship, it will find a beach and land there or something. But the problem was Blue were relying on those, those vehicles for their ASW barrier. And when they had a comms jammer disrupt their comms network, 
and the, the UAVs flew safely home, it left a big hole in the barrier at a critical time, which Red knew to expect and was able to exploit. So submarine snuck through. ASROC was very useful. Um, even if you have lots of, uh, lots of off-board vehicles, having the ability to promptly deliver a torpedo to a point of interest within a dozen miles or so uh, was surprisingly useful. We were very surprised by how often ship launched lightweight torpedoes were used. I've always, um, I've always been rather dismissive of um, shipboard launched lightweights on, on the grounds that if you're actually firing them, you're well within the kill range of, of the submarine that you're shooting at, so you've probably been sunk. Um, but actually there were several times when a frigate uh, chanced upon a submarine which usually knew the frigate had been there, um, but was lying very quiet, hoping to escape detection. Or in one case, a, frigate, a, a submarine who had just completely failed to detect the frigate, as the frigate had completely failed to detect the submarine. And they, they only spotted each other when they were practically on top of each other. So that has changed my view about the submarine. Um, the utility of this hypothetical USV mounted anti-torpedo defense system, that turned out, if it worked the way we expected it would, to be really useful. We got through a lot of sonoboys. Um, that wasn't entirely unexpected, but it really reinforced how many sonoboys you should expect to get through if you're using them in an ASW engagement, especially in a barrier engagement, because you're not just dropping patterns of sonoboys to try and find a submarine. You're dropping a pattern, and then when they run out of power, you're dropping another pattern, and you're keeping your pattern together for a whole week, and you get through a lot of replacements. Weather and environmental effects turned out to be as important as we thought they would. Um, red plans usually hinged on um, poor weather and using the terrain to good effect. Uh, so we were right to, to model those as, uh, as things that they, they could leverage. And finally, um, the game really indicated that even in an environment where you have lots of off-crewed, lots of off-board uncrewed vehicles, Crewed helicopters are still very useful. Um, aside from the fact they're immune, largely immune to comms disruption, um, they are big compared to most UXVs. And big means endurance and payload. So they can stay up for a long time and they can carry more than one torpedo, or they can carry torpedoes and sono boys. Uh, so this game would suggest crewed helicopters are unlikely to go away anytime soon even if we have some really good UXV systems. So those are the things we observed from the game. And the point really isn't any of those things. But the point is that we could observe those things. So I don't really care, or you know, NSSE doesn't really care um, about drawing conclusions about ship launched lightweight torpedoes or the utility of crewed helicopters. What we care about is that the game allowed us to draw this kind of conclusion. So the conclusions from the case study were broadly, does this work? And I think it very clearly did. Uh, we, had, um, we had quite a few people who were quite skeptical that this game could produce anything useful, particularly since it was being run using unclassified open source data, um, who were, for the most part, very positive by the end of the week. We have a quote here from the, the NATO ASW Barrier Project Director, who visited an interesting, interested party, um, who said, well, subject to all the, all the above points being heavily caveated by the artificiality of game mechanics and the nature of using unclassified data vice real world data, there is no doubt that these issues would warrant further exploration in a more developed gaming environment, which is a, a nicely reserved way, I think, of saying, yes, actually, this tool is worthy of, of further study and further use. Why is it worthy of, of, of further use? Well, the main thing is because it generated insights, um, the kind of insights we saw in the previous slide, and it generated a lot of insights which were non-obvious. So the kind of things which you couldn't tell just by looking at the data sheet for a particular piece of equipment. Uh, you know, I could look at the 
I, I could look at the, the payload capacity of a wildcat or a merlin and the payload capacity of a, um, a fire scout. And I could, I could know how many sonar boys each could carry or how many lightweight torpedoes each could carry. But it isn't until you play a war game and you get the interplay between complex systems that mean my fire scout has just dropped a torpedo over there. And in order to get another torpedo out, I'm going to have to clear my flight deck to allow it to land, rearm, and get back out there. Um, and it's not until you model the whole thing that these, uh, these things start to become obvious. So generating non-obvious insights uh, is, um, is, I think, terribly useful from this kind of exercise. Um, you start to get the interactions between complex systems and start to get second and third order effects. Um, the ability to rapidly insert technology and capabilities. Um, firstly, we showed that was feasible, um, as long as you have um, the right kind of game and you have SMEs available who know enough about how these systems work to guesstimate some stuff. But the, the knock-on effect of that is we got this sort of instant arms race going on. People would suggest a new capability and we put that in the game and we play and someone would be like, oh, that works really well. How do we counter that? Um, and they would come up with an idea for a capability which would, would counteract that new capability. And of course, we could also bring that into the game really quickly as well. So you have the ability between iterations of the game to explore quite a long way down a um, countermeasures, counter countermeasures, and um, you know, stuff starts to, you start to want things, want capabilities in your force mix that you might never have thought of because you didn't realize the enemy was going to want a particular capability to counter your countermeasure to, to one of their things. Um, and finally, these insights were generated and were useful, even though we were running a completely unclassified game using open source data in an area where actually all the real data is tends to be quite classified. So a lot of our, um, our stakeholders were quite skeptical that we'd be able to generate anything meaningful. Um, but it, it, it was quite clear that the insights that the game generated were still, uh, were still useful even so. The game could be run in a, a more secure environment with a, a more real world based uh, data set. Um, but even running with open source, it still clearly uh, offered some utility in this engineering space. So that's, that's the end of, of my talk. Um, broadly speaking, we've, uh, we started out designing war games to, uh, to teach. We've moved on to using those same war games uh, for other purposes. Um, and we've shown in a couple of uh, things this year that uh, they really do offer some utility for, uh, for the engineering design cycle for um, exploring requirements, exploring the utility of um, hypothetical future systems, and um, probably will offer us um, ways we can design ships better. So uh, there will be some further work building off this, which I can't talk about now, but hopefully I'll be able to talk about it in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. And James, I am done. Thank you, Nick, for that absolutely riveting um, lecture. And it, it was great to have you also run some of the, the Naval War Games at uh, Wargaming Week. Um, I'm going to sort of skip my, my points and just jump to some questions straight away because there's, there's some really interesting ones. Um, and if, if, if I miss some of them, I'm, I'm sure that Nick won't mind if you, you drop in an email um, on this. Um, so the first question I'm going to pick out is, is how much of the tech insertion was defined in real time rather than dreamed up ahead of the game? Uh, all of the tech insertion was done in real time rather than done in advance of the game. So there were some, I mean, we, we created some, um, the, during the game design phase, I, I polled the members of the group for uh, capabilities they would be interested in including in the game. So they sent me some sort of sample USVs and air vehicles and so forth, and I modeled those. Um, but the, the tech insertion, the stuff we added in halfway through, none of that was done in advance.
was all responsive. Uh, another question. Interesting mention of different experts um, working together, SMEs, naval officers, I imagine, and everything else. Um, if you include friendly and foe land and sea assets in a wider strategic view, what do you feel the practical limitations are of naval wargaming in relation to this experience? Oh, there's a there's a million dollar question. Um, so, um, I think one one really key limitation is that naval warfare almost never happens in isolation. You know, it's it's almost always multi-domain warfare. Um, particularly, you can't really divorce naval warfare from the air domain. So if you really want to model the naval elements of a conflict, you wind up having to model the other domains as well. Uh, and as we get into cyber and space becoming more important and seabed becoming more important, that becomes more and more complex. Um, Sticking with my original game design philosophy, uh, you know, I try to remember what, a, what my game is trying to be, what it is and what it isn't. And so simplify out the things which aren't so important when I'm teaching ship design. That means my model for aviation is very simple. I need to have enough aviation in there to make people design ships that can carry aviation and that can deal with hostile aviation. But I don't spend too much time working out, you know, making the model exactly how it works. For a, for a more analytical game, that might not be the case, and we might have to model aviation in a bit more detail. Is this also a case where we've seen naval wargaming reflect the changing role of navies? Because I'm thinking there was almost this very traditional um, naval wargame, it's purely about sea battles, ships hmm. against ships, and we, we've actually kind of moved away from that, you know, the importance of seabed, amphibious operations, joint warfare, that seems to have had a real impact on, on naval wargaming. I think the seabed is obviously a really big issue now. Um, I know I've argued that the seabed is more important than space to some degree in, the, in this picture now, for the time being. Well, so yeah. do you think it's just reflect, do you think this is now this change we're seeing in naval wargaming saying actually this more integrated, looking at a, a bigger picture when it comes to modeling warfare rather than just making this naval wargaming? Is, is that reflecting theory and practice now, basically? Well, I, I think it's it's undeniable that uh, it's harder and harder to model naval warfare in isolation. Um, you know, it, it's it's just not very. There are relatively few scenarios where it's meaningful to model just the naval uh, elements. Um, but it depends what you're doing. You know, if you're um, if you're trying to design a warship for ship to ship combat, you know, then you probably don't need to model much beyond ship to ship combat for that game um so uh yeah it all depends on the application um another question have you modeled unmanned surface vessels in the war game um do these fall under asymmetric assets so in in the case study game for an ssc we absolutely modeled them um you can see in in the slide if i'm still sharing the slide no i'm not um a, a bunch of the the surface vehicles in that in that game were uh, fleet class USVs being deployed by the mothership frigates, um, usually carrying thin line crater ray towed sonars. Um, they were absolutely modeled as part of the naval forces. They, they were symmetric forces. Um, yeah, I mean, we have a limited, limited range of applications. The USVs carried towed array sonars and they carried interceptor torpedoes. That was all they did in this scenario. But absolutely, they will become a, a more important part of uh, future naval warfare. So we'll need to model them. Given your OA model approach, how do you approach and think about abstraction in your games? How do you decide what are the critical design decisions that students have to make versus design decisions that are less important and can be abstracted? Another really good question. Um, well, the main thing is, Obviously, since we're teaching a master's course, we have a we have a syllabus for the course, and we have uh, defined learning outcomes. So we are trying to teach them specific things, and um, you know, I want them to I, I want them to design the ship for sufficient damage stability. For example, um, that's one of the things which is on the course uh, that, that they need to learn, uh, and so that's clearly a thing which matters to us. 
Um, but really, a lot of the things that that we model are things which we observed students doing badly in um, in, in their ship design exercises. I mean, I've, I've said this before, but um, there were a number of years, about 10 years ago, there, there were it was relatively common for students to design warships on the SDX, which were good ships. You know, they, they, they met all of the strength, speed, stability requirements and so on. They were a ship and not a bad one, but they were bad warships because they wouldn't win in a fight. Um, and it's understanding the more intangible stuff. Um, well, actually it's not even intangible. It's just, it's not the kind of thing that we had them analyze uh, in, in the design process. So things like survivability, um, and range and number of weapons, that kind of thing. Um, those are the things which they weren't learning. And so those are the things which I wanted to model particularly. So it would give them uh, to, to reward good decisions um, and give consequences to bad ones, really. Does that feed a little bit into, into debates about where I think some forget the mission profile of a warship, which is almost, it's very tempting for a student to, to, if they design a ship to make it the ultimate bee's knees, where actually we know how at policy level and everything else, this is not how a warship ends up being, um, how it's originally started out right the way through the process is usually not the product we end up with. Um, is that sort of where students, when they, they look at maybe designing a warship or thinking about these certain aspects, is there a temptation to um, lean to having the, the ultimate ship and because they know what they have to face or actually they take quite a measured approach how do you deal with that type of thing well this so this actually is is one of the central reasons why we started doing more wargaming because um during the capstone uh, design exercise they design a ship and they have to design to a budget so they're given a, a user requirement document they're given a, a procurement budget and then one of the processes that they do during the SDX is the cost capability trade-off. So they consider a whole bunch of options, they cost each one, they assess the capability of each one, and they make what they think is a balanced decision that gives good value for money. The problem is it was very easy for us to assess the cost of each ship because we have a costing model that they could deterministically apply. Um, and it just says, you know, if you want to carry these systems, and you want to go this fast and so on and have all of these different capabilities, you do a, build a giant sizing spreadsheet that tells you, well, in that case, you're going to need this many crew, this many cabins, your engine room is going to be this big and so on. Therefore, your ship will be five and a half thousand tons. Um, it will have this weight breakdown between the different groups and you can feed that into the cost model and it'll tell you, well, it'll cost 250 million pounds. The difficult part is assessing capability uh, because that does not lend itself well at all to um, numerical scoring. You can apply a meaningful numerical score to some individual capabilities, like probability of defeating threat weapon A, um, but no warship is defined by one single mission like that. So you have to trade off um, lots of different measures of performance uh, and weight them appropriately, and that's very difficult. So we were having students making choices, which in retrospect were obviously bad. Um, one key one is organic aviation. Lots of the time we would see students designing surface combatants, which didn't have an onboard helicopter, because in the cost capability trade-off, they would consider options with and without a helicopter, and they would rightfully conclude, my gosh, a helicopter is expensive. Um, not just the cost of the helicopter, but the, I've got to include a hangar and a flight deck. It's the entire back third of my ship. Um, you know, this is driving my ship length up. Um, so we'll bin it. But if you look at any real surface combatant, even down to the smallest, they have aviation facilities, even though they're expensive. And the reason for that is because they are so useful. The capability that onboard aviation offers you is enormous. It's, it's you know, so obviously worth the, the admittedly high cost. But we didn't have a way of students capturing that utility until we wargamed. And about 10 years ago, we ran a real simple um, exercise where we, uh, over a four hour teaching period, we had them play a scenario where they had a, 
I think a frigate with a helicopter, oh, sorry, a frigate versus two or three um, missile boats. And they started playing it without aviation. Um, and they discovered that it was like having a knife fight in a dark telephone box. Um, and then they got to play that game out, add a helicopter to the frigate and play it again. And then they could see that, oh, well, now it's just trivial. We find the missile boats with a helicopter and we destroy them before they ever see us. So it wasn't giving them a numerical score for how useful a helicopter was, but it was giving them context understanding. So then when they hit their ship design exercise, they were looking at options with and without a helicopter. They were costing the difference, but they were remembering how vulnerable they were if they didn't have one. And that that's the kind of teaching objective that we were shooting for. It's great because it, it also links into, it's very hard then to model how politicians and policymakers think because you end up with that, do you want five warships and you're going to have to make some capability cuts. And usually, mm -hmm. however, the design is started out, we see always did not, it's not the final product. We see that across many navies in the world. Um, or do you want one more ship or pilots cut back? I think if you look at say the 23s and type type 22s and the 80s and 90s debates about them, that, that was the type of thing that was going going on at the time. So it's quite hard to balance all these things and, and model them. Um, we're running out of time. I'm, I'm just gonna pick one information question that's really um, come up, which I think is quite interesting. Games frequently model fog of war by hiding information about the enemy, which is made much easier by the role of the umpire. I was wondering if engineering focused games like a balanced fleet would attempt to extend the fog of war to the player's own ship, systems that are damaged but not evidently so, malfunctions that do not become apparent until a system is used again, repairs that seem simpler than they really are, or that actually make the problem worse. Um, imagine these would be fairly realistic occurrences for future naval architects to become familiar, familiar with. What, what's your sort of thoughts on that? Oh, that's a glorious question. Um... In answer to it, no, we we haven't um, we haven't uh, addressed that at all. Um, but I would love to. But I think in order to do that, I will probably need to distill the brains of uh, three or four experienced um, Navy Marine engineers uh, because I don't I just don't understand how that problem would present. We did in the last year, in fact, after the mosque was sinking, we did add um, op defs into the game. So your ship can now have operational defects. Um, and at the start of the game, every, every ship uh, commander has to roll a bunch of dice for their uh, complicated systems to see whether any of them are unavailable. Um, and that's blind information. So you might be going into battle with one of your radars unavailable. And you know that, but the enemy doesn't know that. Uh, they can infer, perhaps, if if they spot you and you don't turn your radars on even when obviously they know their position then they might infer it um but that that allows a an important degree of realism that we weren't previously including and allows us to model the moscow sinking because we've realized our game really wouldn't permit the moscow sinking to happen because on you know in theory her air defense systems should have stopped that attack but with availability rules we can now take account of that yeah, and I think I think that also um, feeds a little into um, how how do you model how well trained people are, their alert status and readiness. Um, quite yeah. clearly, Russian Navy uh, and those sailors were, were not prepared, not highly trained. If we perhaps run that scenario of a NATO warship, we would we'd see a different outcome. Perhaps. Um, um, I mean, I have to say, we absolutely don't model those factors. Um, I would love to. I think it. I think they're very important but I absolutely don't have the data to do so. Uh, and and I, I need to, you know, I, I need to be able to show an audit trail for why why we do things in a particular way. So uh, I think I would need to go and do a bunch of digging uh, into human factors. And yeah, that's very much um, from what we are just discussing, uh, what used to be called flag officer sea training. The ship's company wouldn't know what the day, of course, what operational defects and what order and what they were going to do that day, what was going to happen. And that's quite hard to, to model as well. Um, and then, of course, things break again as well, don't they? And how do you account for spare parts? You know, there, there are loads of, um, yeah. or lack thereof is perhaps I should say. So, you know, or can you bodge a system to work again, particularly maybe in an older Navy that was easier than it is in the new, more technologically yes. driven one. So, yeah. Um, these are really hard things to, to model, I imagine. They, they are, um, and there's a near infinite degree of complexity that you could model down to. 
this is why it comes back to that design philosophy again of remembering what your game is for, uh, remembering it, what it is that you're trying to achieve with the game. And so decide what's important for this game and decide what's not uh, and resist the urge to model things that don't matter for, for this particular goal. I mean, I'm not sure it's necessarily true to claim that things like human factors uh, and spare parts availability don't matter. Maybe they should, um, but we don't yet. Um, Nick, great to talk. Um, I'm acutely aware we're, we're going over time. We could talk for ages about this. Um, I've missed a pile of questions. Uh, I just encourage um, if, if you want to Nick, uh, contact Nick on an email, I'm sure that's that's fine by my Nick. Absolutely. Um, um, I, I want to thank you particularly for fascinating lecture and thank you for kicking off the Naval Wargaming lectures um, for this year. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who's attended. We've had a, a really broad geographic attendance as well, ranging from Bulgaria to Brazil, US, Canada, UK and beyond. Um, so it's, it's been really great to have you here with us and, and, and listen to Nick today. Uh, we hope to have this lecture online in the near future and please look out for announcements on further seminars and keynotes from King's Wargaming Network and thank you for attending. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you everyone for coming. <laughs>